Hello, I'm Eric Huang. You're listening to Saint Podcast, a podcast about the always fascinating and often controversial lives of the saints. This is a history and culture podcast that traces the origins of morality tales of the saints, or hagiographies, and how they continue to impact life today. This season of Saint Podcast is dedicated to mystics, saints who had transcendental experiences with the divine. Over the next 10 episodes, we'll meet saints who had prophetic visions of the future. We'll explore the legend of a nun who suffered from transverberation, literally a burning arrow of love that pierced her heart and entrails. We'll also encounter saints who bore stigmata, the bloody wounds of the crucifixion, and saints who battled the devil by performing the rite of exorcism. Many thanks for those of you who've supported us on Patreon and subscribed to Spotify and Anchor. We hope you've enjoyed the bonus episodes about Saints Dominic Savio, Bernard, and Agatha and Agnes. The next bonus episode will explore the legends of additional exorcists. To become a patron, head to patreon.com forward slash Saint Podcast. That's Saint spelled out. S-A-I-N-T. To subscribe on Spotify or Anchor, click on the description for any St. Podcast episode for a link that will take you to the subscription page. Apple subscriptions are coming soon. Your generous support will help keep St. Podcast going and allow us to prioritize making new episodes. Your patronage is greatly appreciated. The second episode in the Mystic series is about a 13th century Dominican friar. He's the patron saint of Puerto Rico and midwives, and was a powerful inquisitor in Lombardy, northern Italy. His rulings against Cathar heretics made him many enemies, including a cabal of nobles in Milan who hired an assassin to kill him. Although not strictly speaking a mystic, many miracles are attributed to this saint. He's a divine healer of sickness. He's brought the dead back to life. He controls the weather and it's said that he cast out numerous demons from the bodies of the possessed. This is the story of St. Peter of Verona, the exorcist, and a history of exorcism in the Catholic Church. Most of what we know about St. Peter of Verona comes from a 13th century biography by a close confidant and mentor, Father Thomas Agni of Leontino, a Dominican friar who was Bishop of Cosenza and the Patriarch of Jerusalem. Peter's biography was added to centuries later by another Dominican, Father Ambrose Taeggio. St. Peter of Verona is sometimes called St. Peter Martyr. This is to distinguish him from the St. Peter, who was one of Jesus' apostles and the first pope. I'll be referring often to St. Peter of Verona as simply St. Peter. Keep in mind we're talking about the 13th century Dominican friar not the apostle from the Roman era. Our St. Peter was born in 1205 in Verona, Italy, which was then one of numerous feudal kingdoms and principalities that formed the Holy Roman Empire. In his history of Verona, Bishop Agostino Valier wrote in the 16th century that Peter's house was still standing in the St. Stephen's Parish, a district in Verona named after a church at its center dedicated to St. Stephen the First Martyr whom we covered in the very first St. Podcast episode. Bishop Valier tells us Peter comes from a very wealthy family, nobility, although this detail is absent in earlier biographies. Peter's parents are Cathars, an early Christian sect that believed the Christian God to be two gods. One is the God of the Old Testament, who was malevolent, the angry creator of the highly flawed material world we live in, full of pain, suffering, and evil. This god is what mainstream Christians call the devil. The other god, equal in power to the malevolent one, is the benign god of love from the New Testament, who created the spirit and souls. This god of good is humanity's redeemer, who promises everlasting life in heaven. The mainstream Christian church's view was, and still is, that the entire universe, both the material and spiritual realms, were all created by one god. In Peter's lifetime, Cathars were often called Manichaeans, a derogatory term that likened Cathars to a non-Christian religion from 3rd century Persia. Manichaeans also held a dualistic worldview, 
a universe in constant battle between the evils of a material world and the goodness of a purely spiritual one. Manichaeism was the main rival to Christianity during the Roman era, counting devotees from China to Rome. Calling Cathars Manichaeans meant calling them non-Christians. The Cathars occupied a lot of the mainstream church's time in the 13th and 14th centuries. The philosophy was eradicated by 1350, although many Cathar beliefs and practices such as male and female priests, a pescatarian diet, pacifism, a rejection of material wealth, and a move away from the pomp of Catholic ritual have made their way into later Christian reform movements, and perhaps resonate more with 21st century worldviews. And it's important to note that the word Cathar wasn't used by those whom we now call Cathars. They considered themselves good Christians. Religious identity wasn't as clear-cut as the lines between various Christian denominations are today, and neither was dogma. Many who espoused so-called Cathar-esque beliefs would have done so as mainstream Christians with no awareness at all that their ideologies flirted with heresy. Nevertheless, Peter's 13th century Cathar parents are cast as pure evil in hagiographies. The Golden Legend calls them heretical. The Dominican Archives accuses Peter's parents of a, quote, misguided zeal to impregnate the mind of their son with unholy teaching. That Peter's parents are Cathars is significant. Peter would spend his adult life fighting Cathars, and just as he was given life by Cathars, his death would also be delivered by them. Despite his parents' heretical beliefs, heavenly agents protect the young Peter from their influence and see him enrolled in a mainstream Christian school. The Golden Legend relays an incident between a seven-year-old Peter and his Cathar uncle who has concerns about the curriculum at Peter's school. He asks his nephew what he knows about God. Peter replies that he knows God to be, quote, the creator of heaven and earth. This is one of the central tenets of mainstream Christianity and the first line from the 4th century Apostles' Creed, a doctrine that established the official set of beliefs that Catholics and a handful of other Christian denominations still recite today. Peter's recitation confirms his uncle's worst suspicions, and he attempts to correct Peter's thinking. Don't say creator of heaven and earth, because God was not the creator of visible things. The devil created all that is visible. This is a central Cathar belief, that the good God didn't create the corrupt physical world. Peter doesn't fall for his uncle's trap, and repeats the first line from the Apostles' Creed. The two then have a debate over dogma. According to the Golden Legend, the Holy Spirit infuses Peter to skillfully rebuke each of the uncle's Cathar arguments. Indignant and also worried about his nephew's troublesome conservatism, the uncle implores Peter's father to take the boy out of his school and find a suitable Cathar tutor instead. God intervenes. Peter's father's pride swells in the knowledge that his son, a mere boy, has just bested his uncle in a rhetorical debate. His vanity flattered, Peter's father ignores the uncle's warnings, and Peter continues his education at the school. Upon graduation, Peter leaves home to attend the University of Bologna, which is today the oldest university in continuous operation. Peter is now 15 years old, and he meets Dominic of Osma, a hugely influential historic figure who founded the powerful Dominican order centered at the small church of St. Nicholas in Bologna. We know Dominic of Osma today as St. Dominic, and the church where he founded the Dominican order is now the Basilica of St. Dominic. Peter joins the Dominicans a year after meeting their founder. He takes quickly to life as a monk, and every hagiography stresses how very devout Peter is. Here's what the Golden Legend says. Peter always guarded his virginity of mind and body and never felt the touch of mortal sin. Because a slave too delicately nourished may turn against his master, Peter subdued his body by the sparse use of food and drink. Since he was totally occupied with what was commanded, there was no room in his life for what was forbidden, and he was safe from spiritual failings. Peter had another tool at his disposal to keep him from sin. Mortification. 
the infliction of painful wounds upon his own body as a visceral reminder of Christ's suffering and to keep sinful thoughts at bay. These acts of self-harm, coupled with malnutrition, makes Peter quite sickly. The hagiography in the Dominican archives adds a caution to those who might follow Peter's example. Excessive mortification is a sin and displeasing to God. The year Peter joins the Dominicans is the year St. Dominic dies. In many ways, Peter fills the vacuum created by Dominic's death. He proves himself to be a charismatic speaker and gets swept up in the aftermath of the Albigensian Crusade, a 20-year military campaign initiated by Pope Innocent II in 1209 to violently eradicate the breakaway Cathars. Peter's participation as a preacher to convert the heretics proves so successful that wealthy Cathars in Milan decide to neuter him by tarnishing his reputation. Whilst preaching in the city of Como, several women force their way into Peter's lodgings, begging him to hear their confession. The women are sex workers, paid by the Cathars to embroil Peter in a scandal. When rumors of Peter's alleged nocturnal activities reach his superiors, they pledge their unwavering support. He need only deny the outrageous charges. Peter remains silent. He's unwilling to expose the women who are the Cathars' pawns and wishes to bear the consequences of his silence as a spiritual mortification. Seemingly guilty, church officials sentence Peter to imprisonment in a remote monastery at Jesse, a village just inland from the Adriatic Sea. Peter spends several years imprisoned there until finally the truth comes out. We don't know all the details, but Peter is exonerated and resumes preaching. It's now sometime in the 1230s. The military campaigns against the Cathars have ended, and they've been replaced by the Inquisition, a series of church courts created to combat heresy, sometimes with bloodshed. The latest pope, Gregory IX, appoints Peter the General Inquisitor of Northern Italy. Peter's sermons rouse the nobles of Florence to take up arms against the Cathars in their city. He gives them a standard painted with a cross, which leads them to victory. Meanwhile, the mass conversion of Cathars continues through Peter's sermons to ever-increasing crowds. Those in attendance who suffer from infirmities find themselves miraculously cured. These healing miracles inspire in the Cathars another plot to discredit Peter. A Cathar disguises himself as a man suffering from excruciating pains. He challenges Peter to heal him if Peter were up to the task and if his God, the creator of heaven and earth, were indeed the true God. Peter sees through the ruse and accepts the challenge with a retort of his own. I pray him who created and sees all things that if your sickness is not real, he may treat you as you deserve. At once, the man curls up in agony. The pain he feigned is now very real. The Cathar suffers for several days until finally begging Peter to hear his confession, then returning to the fold of the mainstream church to be healed. Most of the miracles reported in Peter's hagiographies, many of which are later additions to his legend, involve discrediting, then converting Cathars. In two instances, Peter controls the weather through God to thwart them. The first is a protracted public debate between Peter and the Cathar sympathizer, Bishop of Milan. Because of the massive crowd drawn to such a provocative debate, it's held outside, on a day that turns out to be a very, very hot one. After hours under the sweltering sun, the bishop mocks Peter. Wicked imposter, if you are as saintly as these deluded people think you are, why do you leave them to die of this awful heat? Why do you not ask your God to send us a cloud to protect us from the scorching rays of the sun that are burning us up? Like the X-Man Storm, Peter of Verona materializes a brilliant white cloud from thin air. His power, of course, comes not from genetic mutations, but from God, who creates the cloud at Peter's behest to cast a cool shadow over the spectators. Several thousand people reject the Cathar teachings that day and return to the mainstream church. Other Cathar strongholds aren't so lucky as those in Milan. When rhetoric and diplomacy fail, Peter warns of natural disasters that will lay waste to Cathar villages if the populaces don't recant their heretical beliefs. Many don't, and their homes are obliterated. 
These anecdotes illustrate Peter's zeal in defending what is now the Catholic Church against the Cathar Christian sect. Miraculous healings of illnesses are symbolic of the spiritual healing St. Peter imparts upon the afflicted Cathars, as are the exorcisms he performs. We'll explore the exorcisms a little later. The historical figure of St. Peter of Verona, though zealous, doesn't seem to have been unreasonable. The one piece of surviving evidence from the inquisitions he presided over records that Peter urged clemency for someone accused of confessing to or sympathizing with heresy. It's not only through miracles that Peter of Verona converts heretics. In 1244, he founds a brotherhood in Florence to tend to the sick and further spread the message of the mainstream church. This charity remains to this day the oldest continuously running volunteer organization in the world. According to the Dominican archives, Peter also becomes embroiled in the politics of 13th century Europe. Frederick II is the powerful Holy Roman Emperor who is king of Sicily, Italy, and Jerusalem. He's also a fierce enemy of the Pope. When Frederick II dies in 1250, Pope Innocent IV moves Peter to Cremona in Lombardy to hold inquisitions and stabilize the region. This results in thousands and thousands of additional Cathars jumping ship for the mainstream church. The noble Cathar families in Milan have now had enough. It's time to take care of Peter once and for all. Four men who are named Stefano Canfalonieri, Manfredo Clitoro, Guido Sacella, and Giacomo della Chiusa decide to pay an assassin 40 Milanese lira to rub Peter out. Pietro Balsamone, commonly called Carino of Balsamo, is the hitman selected for the job, who employs his buddy Albertino Porro as an assistant. Peter learns of the assassination plot through heavenly agents. Like the martyrs of old, he doesn't run from his fate. He embraces it and tells attendees at a sermon in Cesena on March 24th in the year 1252 that he would soon meet his end just after Easter, a victim of murder. From Cesena, Peter travels to Milan and finally to Como, where he celebrates Easter. On the following Sunday, the 6th of April, Peter decides to return to Milan on foot. About halfway between Como and Milan, just outside the village of Barlacina, Carino and Porro intercept Peter and his companions. The 17th century Acta Sanctorum, compiled by the Jesuit Jean Boland, tells us what happens next. The description is quite visceral, so skip ahead about 40 seconds if you don't want to hear it. Carino first struck the saint with a pruning knife or some other sharp instrument, which opened his head with a large and deep wound. The missionary made no movement or effort to avoid the stroke. While the wounded man was commending himself to God and reciting the Apostles' Creed, the homicide threw himself on Father Dominic, the martyr's companion, and gave him several blows from which he died a few days afterwards. Then, seeing that Peter of Verona, though no longer able to speak, was through the sheer force of his will, using his finger to write the first words of the Apostles' Creed in his own blood, Carino sank a dagger into his breast. So Peter of Verona dies a martyr. St. Peter of Verona was canonized or made a saint 11 months after his death, the quickest canonization in history. It's likely the ongoing struggles between the church and the Cathars necessitated Peter's swift elevation to a saint, who was literally a martyr for the cause. Peter is very easy to spot in art. He's a Dominican monk, dressed in the black and white habit of his order. A white tunic overlaid with a black scapular, black hood, and black cape. What sets Peter apart from other Dominican saints is the large knife embedded in his head. Official records from inquisitors who investigated the murder record the weapon Carino used as a falcastrum, 
a billhook machete, sort of a combination of a curved knife and an axe, used to cut back woody plants like hedges. Perhaps the most famous St. Peter of Verona painting is by Giovanni Bellini from the early 1500s. The painting is red from left to right. At the top left, Peter's hometown of Verona looms in the distance. A herd of cattle moves along a dirt path back towards the city. Peter is on his knees at the bottom left, felled by Carino. Father Dominic is on the right, a bit further back in the forest that surrounds them. Carino's assistant, Porro, has just caught Dominic by the hood. Workers gathering wood and clearing the forest can be seen behind Dominic. At the bottom right is a bird perched on a branch, under which is a cloth bearing Bellini's signature. The painting can be seen at the National Gallery in London. A digital version is on the St. Podcast website. Ever heard of the medieval English queen who used boiling beer and attack bees to successfully repel the Vikings? Or the princess in Renaissance Sweden who turned to a life of piracy? What about the 17th century Angolan princess who executed a man for daring to criticize her active sex life? These are just three women profiled on Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Ann Foster, and the goal of this podcast is to share the stories of history's most scandalous women, both those you've never heard of, as well as taking a new look at ones whose stories you thought you knew. Vulgar History is available on all podcasting platforms. Hope you take a listen. The assassin Carino has a legend all of his own. According to two eyewitnesses interviewed by inquisitors, Carino is selected for the job by a man named Manfredo. He knows Carino to be a Cathar and likely, quote, too greedy to refuse it. This quote is from a paper by Donald S. Perdlow entitled The Assassin Saint, The Life and Times of Carino of Balsamo. According to Perdlow's paper, Carino knows the risks of this high-profile hit. Peter of Verona is equally beloved and infamous all over Italy. His killer would likely be forced to live out their life as a fugitive. A vague mention of help is then recorded in the records, presumably protection by wealthy Cathars, as well as an escape plan. Carino insists his assistant, Alberto Porro, whom we mentioned earlier, accompany him. Porro is quite the character. He's a self-styled dandy of sorts and calls himself Il Magnifico, the Magnificent. The moniker would prove to be rather a misnomer, though. Despite his enthusiasm in joining his buddy, Porro the Magnificent decides to stay home rather than accompany Carino to tail their quarry to Como. So Carino leaves Milan for Como on his own, staking out the priory where Peter is staying. On Easter Sunday, April 6th, in the year 1252, Carino awakens to discover Peter and his companions had already left from Milan hours ago. Panicking, Carino asks Manfredo, who was also in Como, to borrow his horse. Manfredo is a well-known noble. Everyone would recognize his horse, so he declines, wanting nothing to connect him to the plot. Carino now has no choice but to book it on foot. Luckily for the assassin, Peter and his entourage stopped midway to perform mass. Peter is also recovering from a long bout with malaria, which slows him down significantly. Carino easily overtakes Peter and meets up finally with Il Magnifico to plan an ambush. Meanwhile, Peter has finished conducting mass. He and Father Dominic separate from the others to have lunch. When they finished eating, they decide to head to Milan without waiting for the rest of the group. So it's Peter of Verona and Father Dominic that Carino intercepts. So what about Il Magnifico? Well, he isn't there. Porro the Magnificent got so scared as Peter and Dominic approached that he fled, running into the woods where he meets the other Dominican friars, then confessing everything in tears. I mean, who is this guy? On his own again, Carino dispatches Peter, then takes care of Father Dominic as well. A nearby farmer witnesses the murders. He apprehends Carino and turns him over to Pietro Avocato, the Podesta of Milan, a high-ranking civil servant. According to court records, Carino cooperates fully with the authorities. He confesses everything, naming every name, contrary to earlier promises he made to Manfredo that he'd keep quiet even under torture. 
Meanwhile, the Archbishop of the region, Leo de Parejo, holds a public sermon to rouse the city into a frenzy over the beloved Peter of Verona's death by a Cathar assassin. A mob forms and Carino is their target. But on the 16th of April, 10 days after the murder, Carino breaks out of prison and disappears. The mob's fury redirects itself at Avocato, who's accused of being a Cathar mule, paid off by wealthy heretics to set Carino free. A contemporaneous letter written by a man named Romeo de Atencia describes what happens next. Not finding the Podesta, they killed his war horse and plundered his whole house, and then going to the Palazzo Comunale, where the Podesta had fled with his whole family, they shouted that they would burn the palace down with everyone inside. Perdlo makes a convincing argument that much more is at play here. The nobles of Milan, Cathar and otherwise, are likely involved in setting Carino free in order to destabilize the local government and take control themselves. And the local government is definitely thrown into chaos with Carino's abscondment. An anti-Cathar frenzy soon sweeps Milan and all of Lombardy. So where did Carino go? A 16th century hagiography compiled by the Dominican Serafino Razzi tells us Carino refugees south. According to another 16th century hagiography, this one by Paolo Banoli, Carino flees to the province of Emilia Romagna, to the village of Forlì. Carino is terminally ill and checks into the hospital of St. Sebastian, named after the patron saint of illness whom we met in episode 2. Believing himself to be close to death, Carino confesses his sins to a visiting prior. The prior is deeply moved by the sincerity of Carino's confession and admits him as a penitent, under the protection of the Dominican order. This is a fairly common practice for a repentant sinner to join a monastic order. One of the original conspirators who hatched the assassination plot, named in Perdlo's article as Daniele da Guisano, also becomes a Dominican after confessing his involvement and repenting. Guisano takes his conversion back to mainstream Christianity to heart and becomes an inquisitor as well, spending the rest of his life persecuting his former brethren. Carino spends the next 40 years of his life as a cloistered penitent at the Dominican convent in Forlì. Hagiographies tell us he's contemplative, obedient, and embraces solitude. In 1269, Carino meets Jacopo Salomoni, a wealthy Venetian who gave up his fortune to join the Dominicans. It's said Jacopo becomes Carino's spiritual mentor, although this is likely an exaggeration to link two relatively high-profile friars at the monastery. Carino dies in the year 1293. His feast day, observed by Dominicans, is April 7th, the day after Peter's assassination. Carino's dying wish is to be buried in an unmarked field for criminals, given the gravity of his sins. The townsfolk are outraged that such a repentant man should be defiled in death. So the city purchases the abandoned field, then deeds it to the convent as a gift. Carino's body is exhumed and laid to rest in the sacristy at the monastery. The townsfolk, though, are not pleased. They demand Carino's tomb to be moved once again to a location accessible by everyone, not just the clergy. So a chapel is built in the church to house Carino's remains. The body of Carino's mentor, Jacopo, would be moved there in the 14th century. The body of a second saint, Marcolini Amani, was added to the chapel in the 15th century. Today, all three rest in adjacent 17th century marble sarcophagi. On the 28th of April in 1934, Carino's skull was translated or moved to his hometown, Cinicello Basalmo. It was a grand procession with sermons likening Carino to repentant biblical sinners such as St. Paul, Mary Magdalene, and the Good Thief. The Church and Dominican Convent of Santa Maria delle Grazie in Milan has custody of the falcastrum wielded by Carino. This is the same convent where Leonardo da Vinci painted his Last Supper mural. Carino hasn't been canonized. He's not a saint, though there were movements in the past to lobby for it. Nevertheless, nearly 800 years after his death, the repentant assassin enjoys devotions from a local cult and has finally returned home to Lombardy where his skull and the murder weapon still reside today.
St. Peter of Verona is credited with numerous miracles both during his life and after his death. There were the ones we've explored that showed up the Cathars. There were the countless healing miracles which read like allegories of Peter's work converting the so-called heretics, the illnesses themselves representing diseased beliefs, sometimes taking on demonic forms. Here's a story that's said to have been recorded by Pope Innocent IV. The son of a certain nobleman had such a large growth in his throat that it was very hard for him to speak, or even to breathe. Blessed Peter raised his hands over him, and put his mantle around him, and the sick man was cured instantly. The same nobleman was stricken later with violent convulsions. Thinking and fearing that he was in imminent danger of death, he had the saint's mantle which he had kept brought to him. He placed it on his chest, and quickly vomited a worm that had two heads and was covered with thick hairs. The cure described by Pope Innocent IV is essentially an exorcism. Like miracle healings, the worm-like demon expelled from the nobleman's body is symbolic of Cathars being expelled of their demonic beliefs. There are several actual exorcism stories associated with Peter in the Golden Legend. The first is a vague mention that he, quote, helped women possessed by demons, forcing the evil spirits to come out of the women's bodies with much vomiting of blood. The Golden Legend then recounts three stories taking place centuries after Peter's death, in which visits to his relics cure people possessed by demons. The official term to describe someone possessed by a demon or the devil is a demoniac, also called an energumen. A story added to Peter's hagiography in the Middle Ages tells of a statue of the Madonna and Child inhabited by demons. Depictions of this scene in art show an animated sculpture with horns on the baby Jesus and the Virgin Mary, and St. Peter saying a prayer to expel the demons. Here's the story of Hirolda, a woman who had been possessed by unclean spirits for 13 years. Hirolda went to a certain priest and told him, I am possessed and the evil spirit harasses me. The priest was frightened and repaired to the sacristy, where he found a book containing the formulas for exorcism. He put on a stole under his cape, and with some other people returned to the woman. As soon as she saw him, she said, Where did you go, you wicked thief, and what are you wearing hiding under your cape? The priest got nowhere with his exorcism, and could effect no cure. Then the woman went to blessed Peter while he was still alive and besought his help. Speaking like a prophet, he answered her, Have confidence, my daughter. Do not despair. If I cannot at present do what you ask, the time will come when you will obtain in full whatever you ask of me. This exorcism anecdote mentions a book containing formulas for exorcism. Throughout most of the history of the Catholic Church, there have been guidelines and specific words to be spoken by the exorcist in order to effectively cast out demons. The formulas have changed little through time and are accompanied by the understanding that they will only work if it is the will of God. Even the act of possession itself is something God has to agree to. The devil needs God's permission before possessing anyone. This belief was solidified during the struggle between the mainstream church and the Cathars. It reaffirms the mainstream view and the view of the modern Catholic Church that God created everything, including the devil, who is subservient to God. Cathars would have interpreted demonic possessions as evidence the devil is equal to God, since he's seemingly able to do whatever he wishes to anyone at any time. Nearly every culture around the world has an exorcism rite, in which an exorcist rids people, places, or objects of evil or unlucky spirits. Here's how Francis Young describes Catholic exorcists in his brilliant book, A History of Exorcism in Catholic Christianity. An exorcist speaks with the authority of God to cast out demons. In contemporary Catholicism, exorcists claim to confront the devil, not only with the authority of God, but also with that of the Church, which they themselves have received by an explicit license. The first Christian exorcisms are mentioned in the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Jesus is presented as sort of a superhero, a warrior against the forces of evil, who recognize in Christ a divinity that even the apostles themselves don't yet perceive. 
The most detailed exorcism is that of the Gerasene demoniac, which appears in all three Gospels. The earliest is Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. Jesus is preaching in the region of the Gerasenes, which is on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. An incredibly strong demoniac dwells in the caves nearby. When Jesus meets the possessed man, he commands the demon to depart and demands the evil to name themselves. This is the demon's reply. My name is Legion, for we are many. This detail, the demon compelled to reveal their name, forms a central ritual in modern-day exorcisms. With knowledge of the demon's name, the exorcist, through God's power, can expel it. In this case, there are many demons, legions inside the man. They implore Jesus to not send them away, and instead, cast them into the pigs on a nearby hillside. Jesus complies, and the possessed herd of about 2,000 animals rush down a cliff into the sea to their deaths. An unfortunate byproduct of this biblical tale is that many Christians, including St. Augustine, interpreted the pig's deaths to mean that Christians have no duty of care at all to animals. The protection of nature is a heresy like the pagan worship of springs and stags. This idea would be challenged by Christian figures like St. Francis, a mystic for a future episode, and also the current Pope Francis, who's taken the name of the mystic St. Francis. In the first few centuries of Christianity, the persecutions by Roman and non-Christian officials were sometimes blamed on evil spirits acting through the officials. Here's a passage from the 4th century Christian writer Lactantius. The men themselves did not persecute who did not have a reason why they should be angry with the innocent. But those unclean and abandoned spirits to whom the truth is known and unwanted insinuate themselves into their minds and incite them unwitting to fury. For Lactantius, Roman officials only persecuted Christians because evil spirits possessed them and compelled them to do so. Pious Christians up through Lactantius' time wielded a personal power to exorcise demons. This was a daily need because they were surrounded by a culture and empire that worshipped false gods, demons. For early Christians, these all required purifying. An early form of exorcism served this purpose. By the 4th century, the fast coalescing organization and power of the Christian church attempted to differentiate exorcism, a Christian rite, from magic, the rites of all other beliefs which were seen as false and heretical. Origen, an early Christian mystic and scholar from Egypt, had this to say about it. Magicians cast spells of an illusory or ephemeral nature in cooperation with diabolic forces enslaved through material formulas. According to Origen's writings, magicians, pagan priests, used demons bound by incantations to do the magician's bidding. Faithful Christians, on the other hand, employed prayers to God to invoke divine aid. Nevertheless, the daily exorcisms performed to purify the church, the home, and the salt and water used in rituals had recent roots in non-Christian traditions. The first recorded ritualized exorcisms were missionary in purpose, part of a baptismal rite to rid new Christians of the evil that had resided in them for years due to devotions to their false gods. Former beliefs were literally evil spirits that had to be exoflated or blown out before the convert could officially become a Christian. The baptism of newborns had a similar exorcism rite to rid infants of original sin and any evil that might have found a way into their bodies between birth and baptism. Although exorcisms and baptismal rites included the purification from evil spirits, they weren't a literal casting out of a demon. To remove a demon from the possessed, demoniacs turned to the cults of saints and their places of worship for a literal release from demon tormentors. It would be centuries before demoniacs would turn to priests and the church for exorcisms. Many Christian holy sites were sacred since antiquity, their ancient patrons only recently swapped out for a Christian saint. St. Martin of Tours, a Roman soldier who famously sliced his cloak in half to clothe a homeless man who was Jesus in disguise, named two spirits cast out of a demoniac as Jupiter and Mars, two powerful Roman gods. The transformation of ancient sacred sites into Christian shrines 
was like an exorcism that symbolically expelled the old gods and replaced them with the Christian god. The earliest surviving liturgy for the exorcism of demoniacs is called the Gelasian Sacramentary. It's essentially a step-by-step -step instruction manual, composed in the 8th century in the Frankish territories, modern-day France and Germany. The Sacramentary is one of the earliest surviving documents to standardize the rituals priests performed in every Mass, Blessing, Rite, Feast, and Sacrament. The section on exorcism takes on the form of a judicial hearing in which the demon is on trial. The exorcism commences with the priest placing their hands on the energumen, the possessed. A prayer is spoken which begins, Almighty and eternal God, before whose face the heavens flee. The next section of the liturgy is entitled Prayer Over a Christian Man Vexed by a Demon. It beseeches God to deign to grant the exorcist power over the evil spirit. The exorcist then addresses the devil directly. He himself commands you, devil who commanded the wind and the sea or the tempests. He himself commands you, who ordered you to be sunk in the lower earth. He himself commands you, who ordered you to go back. Hear therefore and be afraid, Satan, defeated and prostrate, depart in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, enemy of the faith, of the human race, plunderer of death, avoider of justice, root of evils, touch wood of vices, seducer of men, betrayer of peoples, inciter of envy, origin of greed, cause of discord, arouser of griefs, master of demons, why do you stand and resist, when you know that you have lost your powers? Draw back in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and give place to the Holy Spirit. What follows these insults and commands are two prayers, one appealing to God to liberate the demoniac, a second asking God to strike terror in the evil spirit. Now three adjurations or oaths are made. The first, a reminder to the evil spirit to depart out of fear of God, who is judge of life and death. Two, that the exorcist accuses, condemns, and finally commands the evil spirit through God's power. And lastly, the demon is commanded to be gone at once. Despite attempts by the church to standardize and control exorcisms, the practice in medieval Europe was chaotic. Saints were still the go-to figures for possession. Their shrines and relics attracted droves of people, desperate for miraculous healings of every kind. Lay people who had no religious training performed lesser exorcisms. These were virtually inseparable from arcane formulas and spells, exorcisms that incorporated pre-Christian folk practices to combat trivial evils like the swarming of bees or the rotting of fruit. Demonic possession was also now increasingly linked to witchcraft, understood to be the dangerous and sinful enslavement of demons to grant favors, tell fortunes, and curse enemies. Exorcisms were sometimes used to battle witches and sorcerers, but the prevailing belief was that a demoniac possessed via witchcraft could only be saved if the witch who cast the spell or the object used to bewitch the demoniac were destroyed. By the close of the 14th century, more codified exorcism rites appeared. One example is a handbook kept at the Bavarian State Library. It dates to around 1400 and resembles very closely the Gelasian sacramentary we discussed earlier, with the addition of magical incantations and gestures to be performed by the exorcist priest. Here is a sample. Take the head of the possessed in your left hand, and place your thumb in the mouth of the possessed, saying the following words to both ears. Rise up again from here, Abraya. Rise up again from here. Things consecrated together. Epari tumbo poti alicenti alafi. The nonsensical words we just heard are alleged to be a lost language. In 1614, the Roman ritual was issued by the church, which updated the liturgical rules, including exorcisms, which essentially remained unchanged from the 8th century Gelasian sacramentary. It's this slightly amended Roman ritual that's used today in exorcisms. The line between magic and exorcism was always very blurry. This was especially the case in medieval England, where demons could be employed by either the devil or elves. A 15th century English exorcism manual 
uses the very unchristian words I conjure to command demons. It also includes a spell to hurt and kill your enemies called the Trojan Revenge. Satan is invoked to make sure the curse is effective. Possession also started taking on a sexual nature, where incubi and succubi, sensual male and female demons, tormented demoniacs by seducing them. The lore of vampires as demon seductors, thwarted by Christian crucifixes and exorcised holy water, evolved within a rich tradition of demonic possession stories. The 16th and 17th centuries saw an increase in exorcisms. The standard exorcism tropes we know of today were now set. Here is a passage that describes the behavior of a typical demoniac. It comes from a book entitled The Devil Within by Brian P. Levac. The unfortunate victims experienced violent convulsions, their limbs stiffened, and they demonstrated extraordinary physical strength. Their faces became grossly distorted, their eyes bulged and their throats and stomachs swelled. They experienced temporary loss of hearing, sight and speech, vomited huge quantities of pins, nails and other materials, spoke in deep animal-sounding voices, suffered various eating disorders and engaged in self-mutilation. They conversed in languages of which they had no previous knowledge, uttered blasphemies and profanities, violated conventional standards of morality, went into trances, foresaw the future, and disclosed secrets unknown to others. A few of them were reported to have levitated. The Catholic Church was now separate from, and a competitor against, numerous Protestant breakaways in Northern Europe. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the Church cast itself as the only legitimate authority for treating demoniacs. Exorcisms became melodramatic public spectacles that resulted in the successful expulsion of demons whilst luring Protestants back to Catholicism with spectacular displays of miraculous power. Perhaps the most infamous staged exorcism was performed at Laon Cathedral in northern France between November 1565 to February 1566. Sixteen-year-old Nicole Aubrey was diagnosed as a demoniac by her teacher, who employed a Dominican friar, Pierre de la Motte, as the exorcist. Nicole was allegedly able to answer questions in Latin, German, and Flemish, languages she had never learned. A nurse claimed that a black beast crawled out of Nicole's mouth when medicine was administered, and Nicole was able to reveal the dark secrets of bystanders who flocked to the small parish church in Nicole's hometown. The crowd swelled to such a number that the performance was moved to the cathedral in Laon to accommodate the enormous live audience. Nicole arrived at the cathedral in a grand procession. She was exorcised twice daily atop a dais that elevated her and the exorcist above the audience to create a 360 stage for all to see. The demon named itself Beelzebub, a reference to the leader of the Huguenots, members of the Protestant Reformed Church of France. When Beelzebub finally left Nicole's body, the demon revealed they would return to Geneva, where the founder of the Huguenots came from. The twice-daily exorcism show had a five-month run and was a hugely successful PR campaign in a regional battle between Protestants and Catholics, with Catholics as the clear winners. It was around this time that the church made it a strict rule that only those ordained by high-ranking officials could conduct exorcisms. Those who did so without license found themselves accused of witchcraft and heresy. Perhaps the most sought-after exorcist in the 16th century was the Italian Franciscan friar Girolamo Mengi. Mengi wrote many books on exorcism and demonology. They were bestsellers and appeared in abbreviated Dummies Guide editions that were used by the general public like grimoires to find treasure, make good luck charms, seduce an attractive neighbor, and cure impotency. These were all highly suspect activities that further blurred the line between sorcery and exorcism. There's also a shameful link between exorcisms and sexual abuse. Some practitioners promoted the need to have sex with demoniacs in order to free them of demons, especially succubi and incubi. Semen and other bodily fluids were purported to have miraculous demon-expelling properties. 
the possessions of entire convents of nuns also scandalized 17th century Christians. We discussed the Luden possessions in the Saint podcast episode about Saint Ursula. Events at Louviers in Normandy mirrored those at Luden and led to the exorcism of Madeleine Bavant, who had been the victim of repeated sexual abuse since she was 14. When Madeleine was 18 years old, she claimed to have been bewitched by two men, the now deceased director of the nunnery where she lived and Father Thomas Boule, the vicar of Louviers. Madeleine alleged that the men had abducted her and taken her to a witch's Sabbath, where she was forced to wed, then perform perverted sexual acts with the devil, whom she called Dagon, an ancient Syrian god. Two men were said to have been sacrificed at the Black Mass, crucified, then disemboweled. Investigators soon discovered other nuns in the convent with similar experiences. They were all possessed by the demons they had lain with. As was the practice of the day, the exorcisms were conducted in a public square as a spectacle. Numerous onlookers fell into fits and seizures in a mass hysteria. In the end, Madeleine was jailed for life in a church dungeon, the vicar was burned to death, and the deceased nunnery director exhumed and also burned. As time passed, Enlightenment thinkers of every denomination continued to criticize the exorcism practiced by the Catholic Church. Flagrant crimes were being committed by clergy under the guise of exorcism. Plus, demonic possession just didn't make sense philosophically anymore in this age of reason. What would possibly compel the Christian God to allow the devil and his demons to run freely upon the earth to terrorize humans? Weren't the diseases, the deaths, and the wars he already allowed enough torture for the wicked? And if the devil were given divine permission to wreak havoc upon mortals, why were his activities limited to parlor tricks like making a fisherman mad or compelling a nun to bark like a dog? What was the point? Many theologians of the time saw very little difference, if any, between a licensed priest compelling demons in the rite of exorcism and a wicked magician contracting demons in a rite of conjuration. The Spanish Benedictine monk and scholar named Benito Fejo went even further and concluded in the mid-1700s that all contemporary demoniacs were, quote, frauds. Many exorcism manuals were now banned by the Catholic Church in an attempt to address critics and regulate the practice once and for all. Bishops were required to report the detail of all exorcisms performed in their diocese, and many demoniacs were turned over to medical professionals with the exorcists themselves casting a critical, rational eye on every case. Today, the treatment of demoniacs has come under intense scrutiny, theologically and also legally. The exorcism of Annalisa Michel in Bavaria is a case in point. Annalisa was born in 1952 to a devout Catholic family. At the age of 16, she suffered the first of many convulsions caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. When she was 18, she suffered a third seizure while in the care of a psychiatric hospital. The psychotropic drugs prescribed didn't help. They seemed to make things worse. And Elisa started having disturbing visions of devil faces and snarling voices that told her she was damned for eternity. The presence of sacred objects like crucifixes and rosaries filled Annalisa with terror, eliciting violent reactions. Local priests were hesitant to perform an exorcism and recommended further psychiatric treatment. Annalisa's condition worsened. She growled and gnashed her teeth like an animal. She ate insects and drank her own urine. Annalisa's reality had turned into a horror film. There were demons everywhere. On the 24th of September in 1975, a priest named Arnold Renz obtained permission from the bishop to perform an exorcism. The ritual lasted for 10 months. Towards the end, Annalisa stopped eating. She was convinced she had to die in order to, quote, atone for the sins of wayward youth of the day and apostate priests of the modern church. At her request, Annalisa's parents stopped consulting doctors on her condition. On July 1st, 1976, Annalisa died of dehydration and malnutrition. In a precedent-setting case, both parents and the exorcist priest were found guilty of negligent homicide. 
None were jailed since they all seemed to honestly believe they were acting in Annalisa's best interests. The priest was the only one who received any sort of punishment. He was fined. In 1999, the exorcism ritual was revised again, officially prohibiting public exorcisms and restricting the practice even further by requiring exorcists to have a thorough understanding of psychiatric illnesses. The demographics of demoniacs are worrying. Nearly all of them have been victims of sexual and physical abuse as children. Nearly all have been hospitalized for severe physical injuries and were prescribed psychotropic drugs to treat debilitating mental health conditions. Despite modern medicine taking the place of many exorcisms, the number of official exorcisms performed by the church has been growing, and the exorcism course at the Vatican attracts more students every year. According to Francis Young, Part of the increase in exorcisms can be explained by its prevalence in pop culture, beginning with the debut of the 1973 film The Exorcist, based on the 1971 book of the same name. Scholars credit pop culture for placing the concept of exorcism back into the public consciousness, and the exorcism rite as a seemingly surefire cure to all sorts of maladies that a demoniac might suffer. Some believers would cite the ubiquity of occult practices from astrology to tarot cards and Ouija boards that provide 21st century demons easy access to our bodies and souls. Whatever the reason for the increase in exorcisms, the practice appears to work in many cases. Some demoniacs who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, epilepsy, have seemingly been cured or at the very least relieved after an exorcism. Does this mean, then, that infernal beings are really among us? That exorcists, like St. Peter of Verona, have slayer-like powers? Does it mean that the power of suggestion renders exorcism an effective psychiatric treatment for demoniacs? Or does it mean that the Cathars were right all along? That the material world is indeed corrupt, evil, filled with greed, gluttony, lust, and all the rest— that mislead us to seek happiness through physical and material pleasures. The exorcism we all require to be free of these demons is perhaps only possible through a higher spiritual state of being, rendered that much more difficult to attain on earth, because you know, we're all living in a material world. Thank you so much for listening to the second episode in our season about mystics. There's so much more to be said about exorcists and exorcism. The upcoming bonus episode will explore the topic further. Support us on Patreon or Spotify to listen and help keep Saint Podcast going. For images of the artworks, people, and topics mentioned, please have a look at the Saint Podcast website at www.saintpodcast.com. The word saint is spelled out. S-A-I-N-T. Feel free to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for updates. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions for future episodes, please email us at feedback at saintpodcast.com. Again, the word saint is spelled out. Special thanks to Chris McVeigh for providing the readings in this episode. Chris is an entrepreneur and founder of the independent book publisher Fahrenheit Press. There's a link to Fahrenheit Press at the St. Podcast website. If you like the stories we explore in this podcast, you'll love the books that Chris publishes. And thanks again to Stephen Vesecki, a musician and maths teacher from LA who composed and performed all the musical interludes and background score. You can check out Stephen's music on his SoundCloud page, also linked from our website. The next episode in season two, Mystics, is about one of the few female doctors of the church. She's a historic figure whose contributions to science and Christianity are significant. Her visions, described as reflections of the living light, were multi-sensory and inspired her to author numerous works on botany, biology, natural history, medicine, sexuality, and spirituality. She was also a composer whose music is still performed today. Stay tuned for the story of St. Hildegard of Bingen, the mystical polymath.